doing this. Right. It's time. No more holding back. <laughs> Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigilance. It is weekly scrap number 187. Tonight's special guest is my very dear friend and the one and only Kevin McCart. Married to Tracy, his better half for 20 years. He is a firefighter. He has the degrees. He has served on UL panels. He is currently a lieutenant at Horry County Fire Rescue. He's an instructor with Fire Life Training, as well as a CFT Green Team member. He is, of course, a fool, and he loves to bow hunt. have to throw that in there. It is my absolute pleasure to have you on, Kevin, as the guest of the Weekly Scrap number 187. Welcome, my brother. Hey, Corley. I appreciate you having me on, man. This is awesome. I'm looking Pretty forward to it. Pretty excited, brother. Pretty excited. Is there anything I missed in the intro? Anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, no, that's good, man. I'm just a uh, just a down and dirty fireman. Loves the job, loves the craft. Uh, just try to do my part to uh, make the fire service better and share my passion and education experience. I love it. Um, all right, let's go. Kyle is here. He is logged in. He is ready to grab your questions. So audience, please get your questions ready for Kevin and myself. Uh, Kyle is monitoring the chat, ready to kick people out. He has the Zuck power. Um, <laughs> just kidding. And But no, get your questions. Throw them at us and we'll have a good time. Uh, it should be a good one. Quick announcements. If you, are want, if you want to be a part of the Vigilantes, if you want to be a member of the exclusive Cool Kids Club, go to firehousevigilance.com. Exclusive swag, exclusive discounts, exclusive monthly forms. Um, yeah, that's it. Go to firehousevigilance.com. Be a part of it. On to the sponsors. The OG sponsor of the scrap, the original sponsor out the gate, Key Hose. Check them out on Facebook, The Hose Experts. And then there's Affordable Drill Towers, home of the Affordable Drill Tower and the Affordable Standpipe Prop. Firefighter owned and operated. Pump and roll using the Affordable Standpipe Prop. The Affordable Standpipe Prop fits through most classroom doorways for standpipe theory. And then you roll it into the parking lot and pump. It comes with six. six Standpipe valves that can be upgraded to PRVs or customized. Call Steve, 844-55-TOWER, or drop an email to info at affordabledrilltowers.com. Looking to streamline your fire and EMS training programs? Introducing the Fire Academy. Schedule, deliver, and track everything in your organization. Get the highest rated online training from industry leaders. It's backed by Fire Engineering, FDIC International, and GEMS. Sign up for your free trial at thefireacademy.com. <clears throat> Last one, brand new one, the Gone to Texas Fire Forum and Expo Show is this June 9th and 10th located inside Globe Life Field in Arlington, Texas. Gone to Texas won't break your bank and will give you the recharge you need. Two days with speakers such as Jeremy Donch of National Fire Radio, Mo Davis, Clyde Gordon, Rick George, Mickey Farrell, Jacob Johnson, and Dennis Riley. Go to gone to Texas fireform.com. If they ask where you are going this summer, tell them you've gone to Texas. All right. Sponsors done. Guest checked in. Kyle is here. Audience is here. Let me see what we got. Kyle said it right out the gate. One of the greatest dudes on the planet right here. Dustin Duncan said, can't wait to hear this. Zachary O'Hare said, I'm currently at the gym and paused an older scrap just to listen live. Hey, welcome to the live one. Uh, yes, man, absolutely, absolutely. There's there's lots of hype. They said, Bill, <laughs> Bill Tisher Jr. said, Mr. Worldwide, let's go. <laughs> All right, let's roll. Tony Nunes said, oh, man, I hope the call gods let me stay in for this one. Absolutely, man, I do too. I hope the tone stays silent until the scrap is over. Um, okay, Kevin. Are you ready for your first question from not necessarily the audience, but the vigilante question of the week comes from Luke November. He wants to know, how do you mentor probationary members and young firefighters into the mindset of getting out of their comfort zone? What should be your comfort zone, especially in today's world of safety, safety, safety? So there you go. The vigilantes will uh, throw a tough one right out the gate, right at you. Wow. Man, that's a good one. Um, when it comes to, to new firemen, I think, um, I think the biggest thing is just, um, letting them understand and know and explain to them the importance of what it is we're doing. And, uh, when you make it personal to them about being 
into the job and what that means and, um, <clears throat> you know, how important training is of being prepared. What I mean by making it personal is just, you know, hey, would you, you know, like that shirt says behind me, would you want you rescuing you? Not only in a writ scenario, but if you were trapped in your home and your home was on fire, when you make it personal, it kind of sets home to them a little bit, makes them start thinking and um, um, lead by example, man. That's the biggest thing. I think uh, lead by example, you know, show them the ropes. Um, don't ask them to do anything that you can't do yourself. You know, when you set the expectation, if your expectation is mask up in 20 seconds or less, you better be able to do it yourself. Right on. No, absolutely. Uh, how much does it shoot in the foot when it's the do as I say, not as I do? Um, with today, with today's uh, generation of firemen entering the our craft, th that can be very detrimental because th they ask why a lot. And I, I, I really like that. I think that understanding context behind what they're being taught or told uh, goes a long way with them. So you got to talk the talk, but you got to walk the walk. Nice. The uh, expectations for new guys from Brian Schwab. Yeah, absolutely. Schwab. Uh, yeah, here we go. First question from the audience is coming. Uh, Bill Tischer, he wants to know, to hit on that a little more, can you go a little bit into retention and how that could or is affecting the fire service? Oh, uh, yeah. Retention um, retention and recruitment is a big issue right now, I think, all across uh, the fire service. Some agencies are worse off than others. Uh, I think some of that has to do with their culture, um, the size of their department, so on and so forth. But uh, from what I understand by, um, you know, the, the guys that I talk to on a regular basis around the country, it's kind of running rampant. And um, <clears throat> I think that uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better, recruiting and retention. Right. But um, everybody that comes into the fire service or just kind of everyone in general wants to know what the expectation is for them. They want to know what they're supposed to do and not do. So. If you're um, openly open about that and you, you communicate that very well through your words and your actions, uh, that can help. But um, my concern about recruitment and retention is, you know, in today's fire, fire ground, time is critical. Um, you know, homes catch on fire and time is just, time is of the utmost importance. So if retention becomes a bigger issue in some agencies administrative staffs have to be on the like thinking about this and trying to head this off at the path because what i'm foreseeing or what i'm afraid of is uh civilian fatalities are going to get are going to go up if retention becomes a bigger issue because agencies are going to have no choice but to close companies potentially and i'm not saying this is going to happen like right away right next year but in five years, we could be looking at this to where now all of a sudden response times are increased because companies aren't manned because of retention and recruitment. And that's that's going to lead to longer response times, uh, so on and so forth. It's like a snowball effect. So administrations have to, I think, be not just thinking about the recruitment right now, but the retention in the long term to help uh, bridge that gap. And have that, opinion. yeah, that impact on the zero impact time. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, and I think, you know, um, I I was, we just started a retention, a recruit and retention committee here at my department. And I asked to be on it and was graciously granted um, permission to be on it. And um, so we're doing some work and, and it's going well. Um, I'm actually participating in an event coming up for recruitment. Nice. But, um, you know, retention, um, retention is, is the big one. I think, I think you'll never have a recruitment issue if you got your retention squared away. Ooh, nice. You'll always, you'll always need to recruit, recruit new members through attrition. But if you got your retention squared away, recruitment becomes a less of an issue in my opinion. 
No, and uh, Brian said, expectations for new guys, absolutely smooth. Vore Cartel said, remember, this job owes you nothing. You owe it everything, and rent is due every day. Uh, absolutely. I totally agree with Kyle. Um, you know, nobody held a gun to anybody's head to come get on the fire truck. So once you make that choice uh, and you get into your academy or whatever the case may be and you start doing the work, you know, um, if you decide it's not for you, that's right. fine. The job's not for everyone. And I actually have a lot of respect for individuals that get through their recruit academy and get on the street. They're on the street for a short time and they're like, man, I just don't want, I, this isn't for me. And they, 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 they go do something else. Amen to them. Um, I'd rather them do that than uh, be an oxygen stealer. Right on brother. Uh, all right, coming at you from Rob Fisher. Speaking of expectations, which is a great topic, by the way, what do you desire in a chief officer as a company officer? Oh, wow. Nothing but easy for you today. <laughs> oh, my, oh, my, oh, my battalion chief's not listening. <laughs> um, you know, I think um, the biggest thing that, that, that I think that I look for, or th that I appreciate, and and a and a chief officer like a battalion chief level is is just trust, um, and and just under you know learn allowing me as a company officer and trusting me to do uh, my job as a company officer, not micromanage me, um, set the expectation for me the same way that I need to do it for my crew, and then let me work. And coach me if I need coached, if I need mentored, mentor me. If I'm getting off the rails, pull me back in. Um, those kind of things. Um, you know, it's a and, and also um I, I guess uh this this kind of strikes pretty pretty fresh in my mind. And I and I'm not gonna go into detail, but I'll mention it that um you know, it's a two-way street. Um, administrative staff will hand down orders and directives, and as and me as a company officer, it's my job to be the middleman and you know, sell it to the to sell it to the crew and all that. Right. And and I feel like I do a good job at that. Um, I was a salesman before I was a fireman, so I can sell ice cream to an Eskimo. But um, <laughs> it's a two-way street, and when the company officer needs something. And it goes up through the ranks. They need to pay attention to what that need is. Right. And I'm not talking about fist, you know, financial needs and all that stuff. I'm talking about the stuff that matters. Um, th those things need to try to be addressed to the best of their ability. And there needs to be open dialogue on both sides. So I think trust is biggest for me. Just, just trust me in what I'm doing. And I think trust, I don't think tr I don't uh, look at trust as is you, I got to earn your trust or that I don't have to earn your trust Corley. I look at it like I'm going to trust you until you till you give me a reason not to trust you. Your default is you're going to give the trust and let them lose it. Yeah. Is that where you start? Oh, no, no. I, I've, I've heard. Uh, yeah, I don't, I've never dug into that and see where I stand. Actually, I think I probably fall in the same category. Although I may not have ever just dug in and, and figured out where exactly I fall. Has it, has it ever burned you? Yeah, it has. Um, it has. And that's probably been, a um, over the course of my, my life, that's probably been a downside of mine. Right. That, that I give the benefit of the doubt too much to people, um, both in the fire service and out of the fire service, but you know, it only happened once <laughs> with each person. Uh, no. And that's what I was going to say is, would you change it? Would you change your approach? Even with the, the, uh, I don't want to call them fall, uh, but the, the consequences that you have faced, would you change your approach? Um, no, I wouldn't change my approach because I, I think that's just who I am. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily change my approach. But I, but I just have to be cognizant and aware of where it's where it's gone off the rails in the past. Sure. So. No, I love it. 
I love it. Just introspection. Just just digging in. Um, coming at you. Austin Stitch wants to know, in your own individual opinions, do you think the fire service is heading towards being a job rather than a vested career? Um, that's a tough one. Uh, a job other than, yeah, I, I think, I think it is, but there's a lot of good things going on in the fire service that are, that's keeping this a craft and not a job. And I think we got to keep that up, keep digging, um, you know, pay attention to, to the tradition of the fire service and, but also welcome innovation when it comes to equipment and everything like that. But right. also in society, society's changing right. in general. So the fire service has to recognize that and adapt to that and change along with it. What does that look like? I, boy, I'm, I'm just an, I'm just a fireman. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. Great question. Great. I love the question. I, and, and if you've ever got me uh, going on it, I, I have a long, like, 30 minute rant I'll do on this very topic, but long story short, yes, it has become a job. Uh, Kevin hit on it beautifully. And the fact that the, uh, the fire service is a microcosm of society. It's like a little miniature version of society and all the problems uh, you face in society are always going to be impacting the fire service. Now, the cool part about the fire service is we attract the, I think the best human beings to this job. Generally speaking, I think it's in our DNA and there re there's a reason most people that do it are attracted to it to begin with. It's the first responder gene. And they're going to map it someday. But absolutely, uh, society has shifted. The values has shifted. And we are seeing the results of, I, I, I kind of uh, put the market, the uh, post-World War II, 1940s, 1950s. But the American Fire Service, since that time, people who should promote to chief positions stop promoting and just stay on the rigs and extrapolate that out for 50, 60, 70 years now. And we're starting to see the ramifications of policymakers not being firefighters after 70 years. And so, yes, uh, I think, uh, and that's the short answer. Cause I can, I can really go into a whole lot more about <laughs> stuff, but absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I, I agree with that, Corley. I think that's a pretty good explanation of kind of where we're at right now, where we're headed. But it is, but, and, and I do want to say I was painting with a very broad brush and there are uh, departments out there that are getting it on. And there's a swing in the, in the, uh, direction of the you know the the shirt you've got back there that says for them you know that is a, a direct uh, 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 knock against the safety 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 us first culture you know and so there's there's massive movements and drum beaters out there carrying torches that are doing a lot so anyway without going into the whole long diatribe uh, great great question so uh, Greg Van Ham wants to know. With the new firefighters entering the job force, how do we keep them out of the negative attitude from the senior guys? Work. Mm -hmm. I think I think work is the answer to a lot of the problems in the firehouse. Training, you know, drilling conversations about our craft about those expectations and standards and and just keeping them on their toes um you know gossip is gossip and it and, it, and it, it's all over the firehouse right right um, you know my dad told me a long time ago and i don't know whose quote this was but i think it was some somebody somebody dubbed this and but my dad always told me Believe half of what you see and none of what you hear. So yeah. if you use that mindset um, with gossip, it kind of helps. But um, in a true senior guy in the firehouse doesn't have a bad attitude. Absolutely. Now, yeah. periodically, he might get off the rails, which is, you know, everybody, everybody gets to a certain, sometimes that happens to everybody. Oh, there's peaks and valleys for everyone. In there, you know, yeah, absolutely. I, absolutely, I agree. But um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, and then if the company officer sets a good standard and leads by example in that regard, it, it you kind of don't really have those problems. But the best thing that I've found over the course of my career being an officer is 
is if things start getting off the rails for one reason or the other, whether it's gossip or bad attitudes or whatever, work, go work, go work, drill, work out, whatever it is. Right on. No. And I love the fact that you tied it right back into what you said at the beginning, expectations, standards lead by example, and then get out there and put in the sets and reps. Uh, I love Chief Scott Thompson. Anybody who knows me knows that's a fact. And he talks about for because I want to I want to touch on toxic senior people and things like that because I hear that term quite often. And I believe this man. There's not that many bad people in the fire service. Now, don't get me wrong. I know they exist. Okay, I do. But I'm talking about truly bad people. But what we're really talking about is someone who's gotten into the valley, lost their way, become complacent, and uh, has developed. Uh, Scott Thompson calls it allowed to drift towards failure. And for that to occur, there has to be a company officer, a battalion chief, a district chief, and a chief who did not do their job that allowed that member to drift towards failure. Unless they're just a bad person, which again, I start with the caveat of not that many of them in the fire service. So with all that being said, it's great to have that conversation with that young person and talk to them about why that person is where they're at and how to avoid that. And it goes back to the expectations, the standards, and putting in that work. So I hope that makes sense. Yep. Great question, Greg. <clears throat> Justin, are you good right now? Backhouse. Justin Backhouse says, what are some ways you, as an officer, pass along your passion for the job and get the buy-in from the younger folks? So we're, we're following a theme here. Yeah, yeah. So Justin Backhouse, uh, his real name's Mongo. Mongo? Yeah, yeah. He's a wannabe, he's a, he's a truck guy, but he's a wannabe engine guy. Uh, me and him go back pretty far. Um, great, great fireman. He can ride my fire truck any day of the week. But um, um, I, I think just, uh, I go back to uh, making some, trying to make some things personal to them. Uh, shining a different light on, on some things and just not bullshitting them, giving them the facts of why we do what we do, when we do it, how we do it. And, um, and listening to them also, I think is important, you know, uh, read the, if no one's read the book, I encourage you to read the book one minute manager by Ken Blanchard. He dubs the term, um, none of us are as smart as all of us. And you can use that in a fire service. You can use that in your marriage. You can use that in your family life all across the board. Um, th that, that, that helps create buy-in, uh, with, with your crew and with new members. Um, passion, I think it, you either have it or you don't. And, and if you have it, it's, it doesn't take work to, to, to share that. It just naturally happens. So wow. I don't really know how to do that other than just be me. No. And, and again, it's the consistency I like. I mean, lead by example, set the expectation, meet the standard. And that is how you ignite that passion. That is how you, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a consistent repetitive answer because it works and it's what you do. Adam Melkai coming at you. Uh, motivation. Uh, okay. Sorry, Adam. We kind of just hit that. So I'm going to skip it up. Jordan Smith wants to know, hey, boss, do you feel the officer or senior firefighter have more of an influence on a probationary or new fire? Do you feel the officer or senior firefighter? Oh, okay. Which one of the two? Officer or senior firefighter have more influence? Sorry, I was trying to get the question right. Officer or firefighter, which one, senior firefighter, which one has a bigger influence on the new probationary uh, uh, firefighter? I think the senior guy does if he's a true senior guy. Um, you know, it's it, it kind of I, I you know senior guy for me if he's a if he's the if he's the senior guy but it also could be the company officer um more so for me i think senior guy by far just because you know you he's going to be more like a mentor to the pro the probationary fireman Whereas, you know, early on in their career, the officer, they're going to be more like a boss to them, probably mm -hmm. in their mind. Um, and that's, I think that's some, that's something that's a whole nother thing, rabbit hole we could go down, buddy to boss. Right. That's, you know, I'll just be honest with you. A lot of the officers I've worked for, except for a couple of them, 
And one of them was uh, Captain Mike Masker, who just retired, 40 years on the job, great guy, great officer. He understood the difference between being a buddy and a boss, and he knew when to be one versus the other. And that's something that that a lot of officers don't understand. Right. So some people are born with that gift and, and it naturally comes to them. Some people work very hard to get there. <laughs> and some people can't even smell it or find it with a radar gun and yeah, uh, yeah. compass. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's a slippery slope sometimes, but, um, you know, we're in a job to save lives and property. So there's a time and a place to be a, be their buddy. And there's a time and a place to be their boss. Right on. And I think they all respect that. If you, know, if you have a general idea on how to do that. No, that's beautiful. I love that. And, 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 a, and a good point, um, John Haywick was even kind of making the point in the chat and he said, a, a company officer influences that senior man, which then influences the firefighter. And honestly, the perfect world, man, it's this beautiful, everybody's on the same page, meeting those same expectations together, you know, and with the same vision for the crew, et cetera. Yeah, and, yeah I agree. I'm not a big fan of, for that reason, I'm not a big fan of moving crews around and swapping guys around. I think right. you've got to, you know, I think you really have to, to, to give your crews time to, develop a rapport with each other, all get on the same page about mindsets and everything and all that stuff. And, you know, let them work, let them work. And obviously, you know, if something's not working, you got to do something, but, you know, give them longer than six months or a year. Yes. No revolving door crews, man. It, it's just a recipe to, to develop uh lack of ownership, toxicity. Um, a lot of things can breed in that. And when you have the, now I understand sometimes staffing and manning it is what it is, but when you when you can have that crew integrity and let them build an identity that they can own, man, it's power. And that uh, that can even go to the battalion level, also. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Kevin Fluger, Kevin to Kevin, wants to know, Kevin, what ended up being the biggest obstacles switching to a new department? Oh man. And you can say whatever you want about different. I mean, it's a, so, it's completely up to your self censoring as far as uh, topics you want to touch and not touch. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Um, so going from where I was to where I'm at now, the the biggest obstacle was really, um, and I'm still I'm still kind of working on this and figuring things out. Like <clears throat> I'm a big systems guy, so writing assignments uh for different types of calls like jobs and tasks that guys are going to do based on where they're sitting in the rig um and i had that dialed in where i was because i was there for 16 years and i was an officer there for almost for almost 10 years and so moved uh to myrtle beach a uh, bigger department completely different response uh, where, where I'm stationed versus where I was. And so I go from, you know, having three or four guys in a firehouse to having 10 mm. and an engine, a tower, an ambulance, and a paramedic and a uh, quick response vehicle. So writing assignments and task assignments, it took me a while and I'm still muddling through this. I have, I'm almost dialed in, but I'm I'm taking it slow because I want to do it right, but understanding how um, my department operates now versus where where I was before, and the response model with having all those different guys at the station, because where I came from, all that we had was an all I had was an engine. Right now I've got an engine and a tower that's manned, so we're rolling up in our first due with seven you know, seven to 10 guys, depending upon if the ambulance is in-house. So all of that was an adjustment for me. And so I had to kind of revamp, you know, dive into my seat and task assignments a lot. And I have them pretty well dialed in, but I'm still muddling through a couple things. Uh, I've talked with the other officer at my station. Uh, that's been that's been kind of a different thing. Um, have another lieutenant in my station on the tower. Right. So two officers of the same rank in the same station, you know, luckily uh, he's a, he's a really good guy. He's a good officer. He's, 
he's he's a truck guy that's what he does he's and he knows truck work he's been at that station a while so he knows all the high-rise buildings really well which so you know i lean on him and the senior guy nick a lot because of that but um i would say just the 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 more guys at the station more apparatus at the station and um adjusting my seat assignments uh based for tasks has been kind of kind of an, an issue because now if the ambulance shows up those guys are firemen first so it's you know now there's two extra guys what do i do with them you know so i don't want guys showing up from my crew showing up and not knowing what we're going to do when we get off the rig right right well oh, i love it i love it man um Jason Hacker had a question, but Jason, uh, if you're still here, uh, clarify your question. When you yourself are into the job as a CEO, what's the best way to rein in a new guy? Kind of uh, elaborate what you mean by rein in the new guy, and we'll get to that question if a little more clarification on it. Greg Redman um, coming at you says, so as a guy who geeks out in the details, how do you decide how much or what info you need to convey to the average fireman? How much do you dumb it down? Uh I try to dumb it down. I'm a I'm a keep it simple, stupid guy. Right on. I like to eliminate as many variables as I can. And that goes all the way to rig spec, layout, equipment, what you're using, why you're using it. Um and if if and this this kind of go will go right into to my rule of threes. Um I want I want the my guys thinking about no more than three things when we're going to an event. Nice. Because outside of the number of three going into a stressful environment or something that your your body's anticipating that's going to be stressful, things get foggy, um, and 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 I'm and a lot of I say that based on some some stuff where I've researched, but also just when I think about me right in that situation, um, more than three things gap set force live fire layout, you know, those things like, um, I try to keep it as simple as I can, um, set the expectation, communicate that to them, demonstrate it for them. And, um, it's very hard sometimes for me not to go overboard with like engine company work, like hose right. nozzles and like all that stuff. So like, when a new guy, like, I just want him to know how much water we're flowing, why we're flowing that amount of water and how to put it, how to put it where it needs to go. Right. And then let him, that person dictate how fast things get escalated from there. Beautiful, beautiful. And I love the rule of threes. Love the rule of threes. Um, Justin Backhouse coming at you once again. I hope I'm saying, if I'm saying that right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, hitting wow. on your... What's that? That's Mongo. Mongo. <laughs> Hitting on your expectations and writing assignments, how often do you redo your expectations and go over them with your crew? Once you're with the crew for a while and set better, higher goals for yourself and your crew. So how often do you change them up? How often do you just revisit them? And how often do you raise them? Uh, my my seat assignments, um, I, I, I wouldn't say that I change them a lot, but... I do revisit them from time to time because I don't have every type of call that we're going to run, but, you know, mainly fire alarms, first alarms, if we're first in, if we're second in, uh, vehicle accidents with, you know, rescue, those like kind of the bigger ones. Sure. But um, what I try to do is just um, one of the reasons I'm so big on seat assignments is, is I played baseball in college and, um, you know, it's just one of those things like they don't, sh you don't show up for game day and then they figure out, they don't pick the pitcher that day and then say, oh, you're going to play center field. Like they have a game plan on what they're going to do before the game. There's a scouting report. There's all those things. The scouting report for us is our pre-plans on our buildings and our, our district familiarization. So um, just, I, um, I don't really change them often but i will visit them a lot because um sometimes things come up that that i didn't wasn't foreseeing like right. when i the the move like what i just mentioned 
with my seat assignments on with what Fluger asked about the biggest obstacle. Right. I've changed those probably five or six times and I haven't even like really, really uh, told the crew, hey, this is how we're really going to operate. They kind of know because we've talked and we've drilled and we've, you know, had jobs together, but I'm still learning where things need to be. So um, as far as the expectation goes, once that's set and um, once it's set and you create that culture in your firehouse, it runs itself. Nice. If you allow it to. Right. Don't if step you, on it. Yeah. Don't step on it. If you, and if you don't allow it to, it can, you, you can run into a lot of problems, but um, you know, again, I think it really just comes back to communicating that. And if you, well, if you do that, well, you lead by example, you do the things that you expect them to do as a fireman, as a person in the firehouse and as an officer, um, it's, it's really kind of a well-oiled machine. Matt Sleet coming at you. I like this question. Uh, you mentioned expectations. You are a believer. Uh, do you have non-negotiables? Non-negotiables. Yeah, I do. I do have some non-negotiables. Um, one of them, probably the biggest one, is I tell my crew that when when we make an interior fire attack, when I tell them to open the line, they don't shut it down for nobody except me. So nice. But if I, but if I, I, I do my job as a company officer, here's what you have to keep in mind is if I do my job as a company officer and we train and we drill and we spend time together and they understand our mindset, I understand their mindset. I won't have to tell them what line to pull, where to take it or when to start flowing water or when to stop flowing water if I've done my job as right. a company officer. So really the biggest non-negotiable for me is, is when it's time to open the line, you open the line and leave it open until, till I tell you to shut it off pretty much. And would, that sounds ahead, kind of dictatorish, ahead. but, um, you know, too much water's never hurt anyone. So Uh, Tim Sharp, what are your seat assignments? Just briefly, you don't have to go too. I know you can go in the weeds deep, but. Um, yeah, so basically, um, basically they, uh, where, where my nozzleman is sitting. And that's his tool is the is hose and nozzle. He, he, he's, his job is to stretch the line. Um, and that's his nozzle. That's the only thing I want him worried about. So where he sits, I want him sitting behind me uh, in the cab, mainly because, um, you know, a lot of, I, I hear a lot of guys say they don't care where anyone sits in the rig. And I, I don't think that that's very professional. I think that you should have some things set in, like not set in stone, but, you know, have some expectations there. Well, my nozzle been right behind me because when we come off the rig, um, we're right by one another. If I've got to tell, if I need to say something to him or he needs to say something to me, um, we're right there. He doesn't have to go chase me. I don't have to go chase him. So it doesn't matter which side the fire's on. Our pre-connects you are, you have to pull, like you can't pull them either direction because of the, the cross lay configuration. And so I still want my nozzleman getting off on my side of the rig, even if it's on the driver's side, the fire's on the driver's side, because none of us are as smart as all of us. And if he sees something on his size up, as soon as he can see the building, he can communicate it to me. He, I know I make eye contact with him and I know we're both on the same page on what's going to happen. Right. On. Um, if I have a fourth guy, I want him behind the driver and he's my Mueller irons guy. And He's going to bring a set of irons, which, again, with having a truck company in my station, I almost don't have to incorporate that because the truck company, they're taking care of that. Right. right? So I can let him focus on helping with the stretch and humping hose out the door. Okay. Um, 
Now, I'm a uh, when it comes to the cab layout, I prefer forward facing rear seats and not rear facing. I know right. tradition in the fire service is rear facing, but I like forward facing seats because I want my guys in the back of the rig to set their eyes on the building as soon as they possibly can. Right so on. as soon as we make the street, I want them sizing the building up as soon as they can see it. And, you know, sitting backwards and turning your head and twisting around and trying to see the building, like you're just introduced another variable, like sitting forward in a relaxed position will bode you better when you're sizing up a building. Otherwise the officer would be riding backwards. Solid, solid point. Uh, I love it, man. Uh, Reed Hampton coming at you as the younger firefighter. What's the best way to try to bring that passion to an older crew? Get this question quite a bit. So I'd like to hear your take on it. Oh, that's a, that's a good one. Probably. Um, uh, just listen, listen and, and don't be afraid to do, to do work and don't be afraid to do work by yourself. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, I like Mark Von Oppen when he says, no one has to give you permission to be great. Right. No one has to give you permission to go out there and drill. So, right. Absolutely. No, listen, it's, a, it's huge. Uh, Aaron Tischer, the other half said being so passionate in the career, where do you think spouses slash families fit in? Meaning how important do you think they are to your success? Oh man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, they, they're just coming at you hard and fast, brother. The, uh, you know, family, family and uh, spouses are very, very important to your success. I wouldn't be the fireman I am without support of my wife, Tracy. Um, she's, she's probably, she's into the job more than some firemen I know. Um, so you have to have a good balance and I'm, I'll be honest, sometimes I'm not good at that. Uh, the, you know, the family fireside, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to do better. Um, you know, the fire wife life thing that's going on has helped me out with that some, but, uh, that family side of things is very important. You know, if you, if, if things are bad at home, when you go to the work, you're not going to be the top tier go-to fireman that you, that you think you are, or that you right. know, you are. because your mind's going to be worried about what's going on with your wife or your kids or your family. So it's very important. Uh, sometimes you've got to step away from the job and just wipe your hands of it for some time have other hobbies that that include, you know, your family and your spouse, me and Tracy, we like to travel and, and go see places. And, uh, so that's what we do. Uh, we're getting, uh, we're getting a pool. So we're going to be, uh, we're going to be, uh, we'll be visiting the pool a lot. Me and Amanda will be coming by. Absolutely. <laughs> and so the, the spouse and the family side is something that the fire service does not do a very good job of. Right. Like, educating new recruits on the importance of it and what, and then also like the obstacles that they're going to come across during their career. Um, I think it's a missing link in all academies across the country or most academies across the country. And it's a, it's a, it's something that needs to be added. It'll make the fire service better. I think. No, no. And we are, and, and with things like fire wife life and uh, the, the COBC family focus and, and, uh, you know, other things, I, as I try to name things, uh, it is getting better. There is a shift towards making people understand the demands that the fire life puts on a marriage relationship, et cetera, a family. Um, but yeah, the, the, the thing about the job is it will absolutely replace what is most important and your family's most important. Absolutely. Like, it, but the job will replace it if you're not, if you're not vigilant and aware. And uh, especially once things start going sideways then it just compounds man then it compounds and it could be it's it there's, there's a reason why there's so many broken marriages and broken families in the job it's the job is a powerful thing and you got to keep it in check absolutely you can't lose the balance you can't and uh you can't forget what is most important absolutely i agree i think that 
you're right, Corley. There is a lot of good things going on in that direction. You know, uh, Chief Ike and Jessica CFT, they've been, you know, doing things with spouses for many years down there at the, in Pensacola. And, you know, Mike and, Mike and Ann, you know, in their book and their class, absolutely. Yeah, like, you know, what you and Amanda are doing, what um, Sabrina and the all families doing at Oklahoma City, like it's gaining traction and and we just got to keep the train rolling. Right on, right on. Okay. Uh, cleaning up the questions. Here we go. Uh, when you, Dustin Duncan wants to know, when you receive a new firefighter to your crew as an officer, how do you keep your senior guy engaged on drilling the basics and beyond? So new guys coming in, but your old guy's tired of the basics. Let him do it. I think, I think that's, I think that's part of the answer, but probably, um, you know, let him do it. But, but I think that, the basics, if the right culture and environment at the crew level is there, the yes. basics will never get old. Right. Because the, the that fireman that's been there a while, that's been doing the basics and doing the basics, he sees the re, the the reward of mastering the basics on the fire ground and and understands their importance. So yes. so I think I think let him let him take the lead on it and and just give him the resources he needs. And and like Kevin said, you win that battle long before the new guy gets there. You win that with the mindset and the culture of your crew saying, we are going to master the basics. We're going to be the best at the basics. Uh, we're going to take the basics off the table as a variable because we're going to be so damn good at it and we'll never get tired of drilling them. And that's a mindset because if you don't have that mindset, then what's the alternative? Well, these are just the basics. Right. Why are we doing that? You know? And it becomes a pride thing of, no, you can do that in 15 seconds. Here, let me show you. I've got 22 years on the job, and I do it in 12 seconds. So, you know, insert whatever we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you win that long before the the pro. If if, if you're fighting it when the pro V gets there, you already, uh, you're already you behind the eight ball. Right. I agree. Dustin's, you, a, Dustin's a great, great dude, man. I miss him. You used to work with him? Yeah. He was my engineer for for – several years fought a lot of fire with him um he's real he's a kind of an epitome of a senior guy he knows his job he knows my he knows the officer's job he knows the fireman's job um he's a he's a good one right on holly smith at what point do you overlook time spent with the department versus the people who earn their spots based on time they spend working to make the department better so time on the job versus time into the job What's your take on it? How do you how do you address it or or what's your mindset towards it? Um time on the job versus say that again, Corley. Time on the job, just just being there, occupying space versus someone who's into the job, but maybe not been there as long, but put in a lot more effort, making the department better, et cetera. I mean, I would I would take the guy that has more passion than the guy that's been there longer. Sure. Um, I think that holds more value to the department and to the crew and to uh, probably to the citizens. I mean, um, there's a lot of oxygen stealers in our craft and there's no time or place for them, in my opinion. But um, that's kind of a tough question. I, no, it I, is. It is. You haven't, think, had, you haven't had very many soft tosses tonight. <laughs> Yeah. Did somebody ask me about engine company ops? <laughs> <laughs> we got a request in for engine ops. Go ahead. You're you're killing it, brother. So go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I I think it's a kind of a tough question, but I you know, I, I, I don't know. Um it's kind of maybe individually based. You know, that guy that's not that's been there a while that hasn't done hasn't done a lot, why is it? Did the organization put him in that position? Or, you know, did the organization just beat them up and beat them up and beat them up? And he's like, you know, right. I'm just going to do my job. Right. I don't have a problem with those guys if they do their job. You and know? Holly, yeah. And, and Holly, I'll, I'll tack on is a lot of times 
it's it's an organizational or a culture problem because they're meeting the standard because there isn't a standard or the standard is so low. And if they're meeting the standard, then they're doing their job. And and that may not be your personal standard or where the standard should be. And I'm not defending it. I'm saying there's a problem in your culture that needs to be fixed and addressed because if they're doing their job, then they're doing their job. If they're meeting the standard, it may not be yours. It may not be where it should be, but you got to change the standard before you can hold them accountable to something that's not there. Yeah, I, I would agree. Another uh, something else that comes to my comes to mind is uh, I wrote a blog about this um, about expect or, you know expectations. It's okay for your standard for your own personal standard to be higher than your organization's. Don't ever right. apologize for that. Absolutely, absolutely, <clears throat> and don't be afraid to beat the drum to try and 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 raise the standard. You know. Yeah. Right. And then there's a, I agree. There's, there's definitely a way to go about that. Um, you know, what Rob Fisher talks about 10 pounds of pressure, hundred percent of the time. Right on. Is, man, I wish I'd have heard that 15 years ago. <laughs> no, you know? You're not alone, my man. You are not <laughs> alone. All right. Coming at you from Kyle Romagus. Oh, up here. Oh, do I even read this? Uh, it says, did your mindset on engine work change after being involved in the UL studies? Or after interpreting the data, if so, how did it change? So <clears throat> where I'm involved with UL was, uh, I wasn't involved with the studies, but I'm on the UL uh, technical panel for UL 219, which is fire hose. Okay. So um, I've only, I've only participated in, uh, we've only had one meeting. It was a couple weeks ago, but um when I, I will I will speak on the from the fireman side on how my mindset changed about my approach after some of those UL studies is is I think that that I'll, there was a lot of stuff that came out of those things that a lot of people were already doing, including like mentors of mine and people I looked up to in the craft. And even some things I was already doing, but I didn't understand the why behind and the context behind what was really happening. Right. And so, you know, when I got in the fire service 20 years ago, the first fire chief I ever had, you know, he he always said, I mean, when I was a rural department volunteer, sometimes you'd show up and drive the truck to the scene and you'd be the only one there for 10 minutes. and he he always told us like if I show up to the fire scene ten minutes after you've been there and you got any water left in your tank, like we're gonna have a discussion because water in the tank's not doing anybody any good. Right so, on. So I think that the I think what UL and NIST has done in the last ten years is put a lot of context behind fire ground and engine company operations and things that guys in the FD and the Y and a lot of senior uh, experienced firemen were doing but but we didn't really understand the context behind it right so putting it in uh, context with the data with the with the provable or or verifiable studies right right, right. now now we know why flowing early and often is beneficial and the effects that it has and you know now you look at like the shirt behind me for them for the firefighter rescue survey, yes. the work they're doing um, is putting the rescues, the who's and the why's and the what's all that data is, is making us better. And that's, you know, in all reality, like we're kind of data driven or we right. need to be data driven and uh, we need to pay attention to that data. But we, but the important thing I think is understanding, understanding and kind of having a hierarchy of decision making when it comes to fire attack and things like if I, you know, I'm going to do this, if this doesn't work, I'm doing this and understanding the, the implications of doing one versus the other or not doing one versus the other. Right. Right. Which is, which is segueing right into the question I wanted to ask you engine company ops and keeping things simple with the elimination of variables. Yeah. So, uh, Take, you know, eliminate as many variables as you can. I'm a big fan of that. I, I, I like smooth bore nozzles. I'm not a fog guy. 
uh, I'll, I'll be open and honest about that because it's a simple machine. I fought a lot of fire, put a lot of fire out with fog nozzles. If you're going to have fog nozzles, have the right fog nozzles, constant gallonage fogs, not automatics. They have a place on the fire truck and on the fire ground. But my opinion is it's not inside the building because now I've introduced that variable of, you know, potential clog nozzle. Um, this happened to me early on in my career. Uh, had a kitchen fire, I was dragging the line through the building. I was on the nozzle, opened the nozzle. You know, this was 20 years ago. So, you know, we weren't flowing and moving and got got to the close to the seat of the fire, opened it up and the nozzle got, tip got bumped. And it was at about a 30 degree fog. When I opened it up, man, it ran us out of that, out of that place. Oh, I bet. So keep it simple, stupid, open, shut. Um and do as many things on the fire ground the same as you can based on the tasks that you're doing. You know, I move hose and use a lot of the same body mechanics that I use when I search, if I'm searching. And that's that tripod position. So when you're in a stressful environment, the more things you can do the same or as close to the same as you can, you're going to be much better at all those things because you're doing them more often. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, accidental success. I want to hear your take on accidental success application. Okay. Um, let's start with application first. Um, okay. I think the, and now I don't want people to take this out of context, but I don't think the fire service does a very good job at application. But I, I will say in the last five years, we are definitely trending in the right direction. When you talk about all the studies that have been going on with NIST and UL and um, the rescue survey and just, just uh, you know, the conferences even, the conferences and the trainings across the country, uh, there's a lot of great stuff going on. You know, the stuff that Chief Ike's been doing at CFT for many years. That's gained a lot, gaining a lot of traction. And a lot of the fire service is applying those things they're learning at those conferences down there. And that's great. We got to keep that going. But where I see us struggling is, um, uh, well, you know, a lot of departments don't even know UL Fire has a fire academy online that's free. That you can create a little account. You go on there and there's all kinds of great uh, training resources there that don't cost anything. and some some training uh, departments are missing the boat on that. Um, another thing is line of duty deaths and close calls. I mean, it's a broken record. Yeah, it, it's a it's this it's the same things over and over and over and over. You know, no, it's, absolutely. It's, and I don't understand why we're missing why we're not paying attention to those things. And looking at our agencies and our practices and and um, changing them or making them better so that we don't repeat those things, you know? No, absolutely, brother. I preach it. Preach but, it. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I think that uh, it is getting better, but, but we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do. Uh, I want to switch gears on you and go to athletic sports. You played some ball. Yeah, uh, and I, how I, the fire service can learn from it. I did. Um, before we go to that, I do want to touch on accidental success. Oh yeah, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. So, um, what does that look like? Um, it's something that I'm kind of passionate about. That um, sometimes it's hard for me to convey the message, but um, accidental success is something that you do not want to have on the fire ground. And what that may be is like, let's say that, um, let's say your organization has three or four stations that cover a small geographic area. You've got, you know, three or four guys on the rig all the time. And your response times to your box alarm areas is pretty good. So, you know, you catch a fire, you roll up on it. It's in its incipient stage. You know, you stretch you, you know, you stretch a line, you stretch a, a booster line and you put it out. And because of your response times, 
and the stage of the fire and the size of your buildings you might be going to, you 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 begin to build a false sense of security in your winds on the fire ground. And then all of a sudden you're delayed in traffic and you don't get there when you have typically been getting there. And that fire's beyond that booster line or beyond that inch and three quarter state, but you still pull the same size line because that's what you know from that memory bank and those wins you had in your career. And then we wonder why we burn burn a mask up or, you know, a guy gets hurt or, right, you right. know, lose a civilian or whatever. So you don't ever want to be accidentally successful. You, you have a, you have an incident on a fire ground and you're like, whoo, in the hot water. You're like, man, that was a close call, man. We almost got burned up in there or whatever, you know, right. like it's important to talk about those things. But again, it comes back to application. You got to apply what you learn from those calls both good and bad and make sure that you don't do them again or you do them again if you did get a win. So accidental success can be tricky um, and it's it's it can be deadly over the course of time. And so it's really hard. Like I use uh, uh, this is this is a very professional example of 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 this was not accidental success, but what I'm getting at is, is taking a hard look at your operation of what you did or didn't do, and then making an adjustment over what you learned. But if you remember uh, DJ Stone's v, uh, VES yeah. situation a couple of years ago. Yes. So after that incident, they looked at that thing objectively and they tore it apart and, and they were like, you know, it, it they realized that the tools the officer were carrying could be better. So they they changed it up and they married the six foot hook with the Holligan. They actually went to a fab shop and they're like, well, the tab on here until we can marry these because we figured out during this situation that if they would have had that, maybe they would have gotten been able to get in the building quicker because of the height of the window. So that's that's being professional in, in our craft and looking at even a win they looked the at win. The win yeah and they said we can do better so just be careful when you when you have a situation and it looks like you were successful make sure you dissect it make sure you weren't accidentally successful and then the other thing i'll say is um aggressiveness and manpower can hide a lot of fire round inefficiencies and can lead to accidental success mm. no that's solid um I like it, man. Owning your current position. Um, owning your current position. Um, so I, this this came from kind of uh, your previous or your first five questions for firefighters you had. Right. You always ask the question about um, the best your position. opinion. Yeah. yeah. Or, to ask the question, Corley. I don't remember. In your opinion, what is the best position to be in in the fire service? Um, so I really think like wholeheartedly, when I look at the positions in the fire service, the company officer is the best one for a lot of the same reasons everybody else talks about. But okay, I was asking, there sounds like there's a but coming. So I want to hear a, the there's a but, and my okay. but is that the best position in the fire service should be the position, the current position you hold. You should own that position and be the best nozzleman you can be, be the best engineer you can be, company officer, battalion chief, or fire chief, whatever it is. That's whatever position you're currently in is should be your best, should be the best position in this fire service in your opinion. No, that's a brilliant mindset. Brilliant answer to that question, honestly. And it is, it's, you can't argue that point. That's a great, great point. But it does make for a boring question if everybody answers the same way. So uh, 100%, but I do get, I do get exactly where you're coming from. On that note, book. I love talking books. Absolutely love hearing what book or books people are reading. And I want to know what book or books you think I should read and the audience should be reading. Books or books? Um I've got a few uh 
I got a few. Uh, there's there's uh, this one, uh, the combat position by uh, Chris Brennan. Yes, it's a solid book. Uh, if for those of you that don't know who Chris Brennan is, uh, he's fire service warrior. Fire back service today. warrior. Yeah. Uh, he got. I think he got uh, had a jo- on the job injury and um, he's been dealing with that. But uh, he was a great. He was a great guy. Like a lot of early on in my career, he, uh, I got somehow stumbled on the fire service warrior and Brian Brush and those guys, Gary yeah. Lane. They were doing some great things, and uh, that's a great book. Um, this one, Fire Psych, Ooh. Fire Psyche, right on Who by uh, Eric Nuremberg. Oh, Nuremberg, and, okay, out of Iowa. Yep, Iowa City, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, goes into mental toughness and the valor mindset for the fire ground. I don't think I've, I didn't know he wrote that. I mean, I, honestly, that's my ignorance there because I'm pretty excited to write that one down. All right, sorry. Go on. Carry on. Um, any of the pass it arms? Right, yes. They're pretty solid. Um, couple leadership ones. I don't know if you know about this one. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> no, that's a uh, that's a solid solid dude, man. Solid right. This one here, No Exceptions Leadership yes. by Chief Jason Hovelman. Yes. Great book. He's got a couple other ones out there. Anything you can get your hands on with Chief Hovelman is great. Absolutely. And his and his academies he does online too. Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple more um that I'd like to I'd like to mention. Uh always. This one, I think I got this off of Venator Search or Irons and Ladders a long, long time ago. Yeah. Hard to not. Engine company operations, like, it's, this is it. That'll change uh, your life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then another one that's that's right there with that one is the Book of Shoot. Right on. Uh, another solid one. Um Anything that's got Andy Frederick's name on it or Jeff Shoup is a win. Solid. A uh, couple trade magazines that I that I I read. Um, this one, WNYF. It's a great, uh, great one. I always try to remember. It's with New York firefighters, right? Yeah, I believe that's what it. Yeah, with New York firefighters. Yep. And then FDTN. Yes. This one, you know, it's cheap. Uh, because he's doing it for the right reasons. Right on. Um, uh, Chief Ike started doing CFT fire ops, giving them out at the conferences and stuff. A lot of great information in in these. Um, oh yeah. And then probably my favorite one of all. Oh okay. Is this one? Now what all what all is in there? I mean, I see the I see this worth the risk. I see brass this tacks. Is, this is notes. And stuff from all the conferences and that's, trainings I've been to. That's pretty damn impressive, my so friend. So I, 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 all the time reference back to that. So I encourage you, every, everybody to take notes. You know, not everybody's a smooth bore cartel kind of note taker right. guy. I've tried but, to emulate. I've tried. <laughs> I'm a pale imitation of the master. But go ahead. Yeah, but uh, uh, I'm I'm still a write down guy. I'm not a computer guy. I like to write stuff down and uh refer to that uh periodically all those articles and articles and things that uh i've taken notes on so i think there's two or three pages in there from a guy named corley moore so (laughs) that's awesome man i appreciate both plugs so i really do Uh, a couple more questions coming um john shackleford wanted to know because we talked about buddy to boss earlier so i wanted to throw these couple questions what's the best way to make that transition in your opinion You just thought all the hard questions were gone, and John showed said no. How to transition from buddy to boss? Um, that's it's it's kind of hard to transition from that, but man, I don't know, Corley. Uh, it's tough. No, no, yeah. it's tough. Uh, like I said, not a t- not an I, easy one at all. To transition from buddy to boss. Probably, um, that probably takes a little time. Um, 
on both parties. And it can be harder to do if, if your fireman doesn't have an open mind yeah. to that or doesn't understand, understand things. I think the officer, the, or, you know, to transition from buddy to boss, I think there has to be a hard conversation between the two um, and just kind of an open candid conversation about, Hey, like there's going to be times where I need to do this, be your boss. And, you know, don't, uh, don't, I'll do it respectively and, and all those things, you know, try not to hold it against me, you know, when we're drinking a cold beer in the evening or whatever, you know, um, right on. it's not easy. No. And I will say that, that, uh, one thing to keep in mind, if you're having to make that transition, um, is the person in the inferior position, the person who did not promote, the person you're now in charge of, they kind of control uh, the relationship because if they can stay respectful, you can absolutely remain buddies and be their boss. But if they expect special treatment, if they expect rules to be you know, overlooked or expectations to be lowered because of the buddy thing, if they expect you to not do your job as, a, as the boss, then that's where you either abdicate and don't do your job or you just be the boss and you can't be a buddy. And yeah. so it really is controlled by the lower person. Uh, it depends on what they will allow. If that make if that makes sense, how I'm explaining it there. Yeah. I follow you. I follow you. Uh, you, should answer, you may, you should answer that one. No, it was good. It was good. <laughs> I just, I, I, I tell that to a lot of people. I, I, uh, so I, I, I always throw it in there. Um, yeah. Brian Schwab said a true buddy will never cross that line in the sand, right? A true buddy will never force you to be the boss. They'll be looking out for you to, so you don't have to. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. We've made it to this point. It is, I don't know how much longer these are going to last. I'm, I'm starting to take submissions for what I think it's going to be called the, uh, I don't, I don't know exactly what I'm going to call the next five, five or whatever. The next, next five. We'll work on something catchy, but this <laughs> is the next five questions for firefighters. After 120 episodes, we switched it up and these have been for the last 60 or 70 uh, and they will be changed up again. But for now, the answers are 100% your opinion. And the points are arbitrary, assigned by me with the help of the audience. So, Kevin McCart, my question to you is, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? I guess, yeah. All right. Question one, what single characteristic makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and the top tier go-to badass firefighter? That's an easy one for me. Passion. Cause I, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting that question as a guy that's already on the job and passion to me is a difference maker because if he's passionate about the craft, um, he's always going to be prepared. He's always going to be wanting to get better. He's always wanting to know why and all those things. Passion, like hundred, 110%. 110%, man. I love the answer of passion and oh Tony Nunez said max points. He said it before you started answering though. So I just <laughs> want you to know that. But I agree. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> I agree. Max points. Um max points on number one. So so far, one for one. If you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie, what would it be? Drill more and ask why. Ooh. Okay, go ahead. I, I'm gonna I, before I say anything, Max Stat Gums. Someone said Max Stat Gums. Um, drill more. Ask. I love drill more. The ask why I also love. I'm just wondering if there is a trap in there when you ask why too much. Is you know I'm, I'm asking. Uh, to certain people, there is sure. No, that's what I'm wondering. That's why I, I, I I'm just digging into it. Yeah, yeah. To certain people, there is, but I think. To just say, this is how we do it, because that's what I, that's, you know, I, cause I told you so that's not, I, I don't think that that's, that holds weight. You got to put things in context and, and allow people to understand the why behind. I love it. Things Dude, you're doing. I love the answer. I love drill more period. Cause it, it ties. I also love the consistency. Cause you said earlier work, put in the work. 
So you got two for two max points. Number three, someone actually asked this question earlier, but I saved it because it was one of the next five questions. Uh, what is your favorite training drill? <laughs> my favorite training drill is the drill that my company wants to do. The drill my company wants to do, but my favorite personally is is stretching lines, flowing water, and working on hose and nozzle mechanics and everything that goes into that. You save Sounds more good. life and property with that piece of equipment than anything we buy in the fire service. I love it, man. I love I love both answers. First of all, the first answer is kind of like the position you are in on question three of the old five, because you say whatever my crew wants to do, but it's solid because whatever your crew wants to do needs to be the most important. So I can't argue that you would get max points for that. And then the ex expounding on your personal favorite uh, just drives it home. Number four. So three for three, by the way, and everybody's agreeing so far. So it's not just me. Uh, what mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career? Um, this this kind of has a this kind of has a two part thing. Can't judge a book by its cover. And what I mean by that is is on the fire ground, one of I had a fire early on in my career where I was volunteering that um, I didn't understand really what happened until later on in my career looking back on that fire, but can't judge a book by its cover. You know, it's kind of like fits right along with like nothing showing means nothing showing. Right. Right. And it was a basement fire. Um, neighbor called, called it in, said they thought they heard a smoke detector sounding. We showed up, nothing visible. It was at nighttime. It was in like, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And it was a single, uh, it was a single story, had a walkout or not a walkout, but it had a basement. All it had was casement windows in the foundation because it didn't have like a walkout or anything and did kind of a 360 couldn't really see anything uh nobody was home went in the front door there was little to no smoke upstairs and opened the basement door to go down the stairs and it was completely full of smoke like a lot of pressure behind it we opened the door and I didn't really understand. And what had happened was, is once we, we figured out what was going on was it was a, a fire in a bedroom down there and it, and the, the house was sealed up so tight. It kind of just burned itself out, ran out of oxygen. Sure. And so after that fire happened um, and I matured and progressed in my career with education and experience, it went back to that fire and kept thinking about, man, what if we would have been, what if they'd have called 911 five minutes earlier right or 10 minutes earlier right and the same thing happened and we opened that door right could have been a completely different outcome so uh that's the fire ground side of things um the other portion to that uh mis that mistake is um you know there's a lot of people in our craft that 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 struggle with application the same way the fire service does and I've worked for and I've seen guys that are very smart, super duper educated. They go to all these conferences. They're always out on the front pad, reading books, smoking cigars, doing their thing. And they can't pour piss out of the boot. Right on. So can't judge a book by its cover. Pay attention to that on the fire ground. But um, I've given a lot of people the benefit of the doubt when it comes to that scenario and have realized that they weren't who they said they were or thought they were nice uh very nice uh four for four max points without a doubt especially uh the two facets of the same answer uh final question yeah bill tisher said max points game over uh <laughs> number five heavy fire and searchable space would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on ves <laughs> So, um, 
man, I don't know, Corley. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> man, I've asked this uh, question I, about 180 times, I believe. 187 times. Yeah. So. Uh, it's it's easy for me. Uh, I want to be on the nozzle. Um, my, I, I just, I think that uh, the nozzle takes, makes, and creates survivable space like many, many other fire service icons have said and and it's been proved and uh, i think that 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 also allows for uh better searches and gives crews who are doing ves or searching gives them more time and it gives uh anybody that's in that building more time and uh i i think that uh an aggressive well-trained nozzleman that has a gold standard package on his attack package um, is a difference maker on the fire ground and can change outcomes and possibilities. Love it. Love it. Max points. I mean, hundred percent. I mean, you had it at, uh, there's no, and again, the answers, there's no wrong answer. I just want to hear the reasons behind it. And that's where the points come from. And absolutely. And everybody agrees. There was about 50 people that said nozzle, 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 nozzle. I think they know you. Uh, but there you go. Five questions for firefighters, max points across the board. Uh, yep. Solid. Uh, and then Rob Fisher brought up that, Hey, we never returned to Kevin's college baseball experience and how it set him up to be a solid fireman. We kind of, we talked about sports, but then we kind of, I kind of lost the question and never got the answer. So unless I'm wrong and, and you hit what you were wanting to hit, but Rob, Rob called me out. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, so, uh, Baseball was a a childhood passion of mine. I still love baseball, watch baseball um, a lot. But um, I played it at a pretty high level. I was a pitcher, threw the ball pretty hard, um, was uh, talking and, you know, took personality tests for professional teams, had them talking about draft, getting drafted and such. And I kind of got tired of just hearing that fact that uh, I wasn't tall enough. And so I, I, I kind of got burnt out on it, it to be honest with you, because once you get to the college level, it's 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 the only days you're not playing baseball is Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. And it just I just kind of got burnt out on it and kind of just kind of walked away from it. But um, what I think what how it set me up for success in the fire service is just the repetition, the repetition of the work. So I was a pitcher and I had, you know, did all the, you know, drilling and throwing in the off season, and all that. And from repetition, I could get on the mound, close my eyes and go through my windup and throw the ball where I wanted to. Wow. And that only came because of, over and over and over and thousands over. and thousands, of thousands reps. And, yeah. yeah thousands and thousands of reps and so that has transpired into my fire service career is just that work and reps is you know the right work and the right reps and the right way make a difference perfect but, but i think i think we can learn a lot from sports because of the accountability aspect Okay. You know, you don't, um, you know, you have a coach that an organization has said entrusted to them and said, we want you to be the coach and lead our team. And they do that. And you'll have an, uh, somebody on the team that's the team captain or whatever. And things just get handled at the lowest level possible. Effective teams, the coaches don't ever have to get involved. Nice. Because because the players and the firemen are keep holding each other accountable because because you know um, the shortstop booted three balls or you know the catcher dropped three called strikes or whatever the case may be you know everybody's allowed mistakes but repetitive mistakes um, when that starts happening in the sports field like your those teammates man they're they're in it to win it. So, so they're calling you out. Like they, they handle things themselves a lot of times. Solid. I like the accountability aspect, especially, uh, again, it all ties together. Consistency work, the reps, accountability, expectations, the standard, man, it's, it's beautiful, man. It is full circle. And that officially 
makes it 187 scraps in the books. My friend Kevin McCart, uh, thank you for sharing your evening with me. But if someone wants to get a hold of you or reach out for more info, how can they do that? Uh, I'm on Facebook. Um, you can call me. My phone number is 573-535-8415. Um, you know, I email, but just call me. Send me a message on Facebook. I'll, I'll I'll help anybody out that 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 is that wants to get better or, or has a question or needs help with something. Um, I've driven many miles. I've flown pretty far and paid my own way to things just to help people drill and train. And I'm not the sharpest crown in the box, but uh, I do have a lot of passion for this craft and 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 I, I just like sharing it and my, sharing my education and my experience. And maybe maybe it helps somebody uh, and makes them better. Oh, there's no doubt of that. There's no doubt of that. And I thank you for sharing that passion and having that passion to share it. Uh, there you go. Housekeeping time at the end. Go to firehousevigilance.com. Join the vigilantes. It's five bucks a month. It's the price of a cup of coffee. Or you can pay for it by the year if you don't like subscriptions. Uh, we are currently uh, working on doing vigilante meetups. We're doing one at FDIC here in uh, at the end of April, an official vigilante meetup with the venue. And we're going to, everybody that's there at FDIC, get together, hang out, uh, see each other. Another big thing is the vigilante uh, coin. The only way you can get it is to be in the vigilantes. Let me see if I can show the back. But they're numbered. And like this one's done. There's no more being made. Like if you did not join in 2022, you will never see this coin. Uh, but when your anniversary comes around, boom, it comes in the mail. So it's very exclusive. And I'm already designing one for 2023, which I think is going to be pretty cool. So anyway, uh, hopefully someday, you know, 10 years from now, there'll be 10 of these coins. And the only way to have done it is to be in it from the start. I think that's just a really cool concept. Um, the scraps and the killer lineup of 2023 continues because we got next week, Derek Roberts, and then Matty Johnson, and then Mike Turpak. Uh, does it get any better? Uh, just, just flying along everyone, uh, go rate the podcast, rate the nine L's, go get the audible, buy the book. Uh, my <laughs> brother, Kevin McCart, thank you for being such an awesome guest tonight. Hey, thanks Corley. I appreciate it. Thanks to everybody who tuned in and asked questions and, uh, Maybe maybe I can be back another time and we can get my wheelhouse of engine company out. <laughs> hey, people loved your stuff on culture, leadership, and expectations. <laughs> well. uh, audience, you make uh, the scrap magical. Thank you for tuning in live. I love you all. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for uh, being so awesome that Kyle has to dig through and find the questions. It's awesome. Uh, remember, mutts don't scrap. I hope the tones stay silent unless it is burning. Everybody. Stay safe out there. Good night.